Thank you all for coming uh, today. Welcome to the East Tennessee History Center. I'm Dr. Warren Doctor, the president of the East Tennessee Historical Society. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, just as a round of hands, did, did everybody hear about this online or in publication? I'm just curious who all, how we found out about this. Publication? Online, most uh, Okay. Um, there you go, Ken. That's for you. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you all as well. This is actually our final brown bag of the year. So this is, this is a special brown bag uh, and a very interesting topic. Uh, so thank you all for coming. And then uh, next year our brown bags will kick off, I think, in early February, mid-February, late February. Uh, so we'll be having, for the holidays, our, our break. Um, but thank you all for coming out and supporting. And if you're not a member of the East Tennessee Historical Society, I'd like to encourage you to join if you can. Um, so today's speaker uh, is here talking about his book, which is Pogi Bates' War. And um, I think it's a remarkable, remarkable book and story. And I'm just going to speak a little bit about Nick here. Um, Nick has been a friend of the society. He uh, is an attorney here. Uh, and well, well, senior attorney for the TVA, uh, and, and a historian in his own right, I, although I don't know what you graduated in, but you went to Vanderbilt University um, and had uh, got your, your JD with honors from the University of Tennessee and has been um, a board of directors, has been on the board of directors and vice president of the uh, Tennessee and Knoxville, excuse me, I've messed that up, the East Tennessee Veterans Memorial Association, which is how Nick and I met, I think. Um, uh, so, it's a real honor to have him come speak uh, and to talk about the, the Marines' experience and, of course, your father's experience in uh, the Second World War in the Pacific, which actually mirrors uh, uh, my, my uncle wrote a, a similar uh, book called Hurry Up and Wait. So I'm, I'm interested to hear your, your version as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And I am delighted to be here with you all today. Hopefully everyone can hear me well up here. Uh, you know, I, I like you mentioning that your uncle's book title was Hurry Up and Wait. There's an awful lot of that in the life of anybody in the military and certainly in the average Marine during World War II. Uh, I hope that will not be the theme for my talk today because <laughs> I intend to move at a pretty good sp speed. Uh, I'm going to try to reserve about at least 10 to 15 minutes at the end for question and answers. And so before I begin, I will just uh, start off, I guess, by noting a couple of interesting things on the calendar that occurred to me as I was preparing for the talk today. And one of them is obviously today is December 6th, which uh, for those of us who bear the name of Nick is an important day to us because in the custom of many churches and in European custom, this is the feast day of St. Nicholas. So I figure if I have the name Nick, I should at least recognize the debt that we owe to St. Nicholas, uh, who also became Father Christmas and Santa Claus. And I'm certainly not built like Santa Claus, nor do I hope to be, but you know, I think it's worth just noting December 6th for that reason. But the more important reason relevant to this, obviously, is think about this, 82 years ago, if we were alive and sitting in Knoxville, Tennessee, we would be on the cusp of a day that would change the lives of everybody in this room, even those of us, most of us who were not alive then. It certainly changed the life of a young middle Tennessean from Franklin, Tennessee, a fellow named Jack McCall. And so you will see him above me. Uh, that's him in his dress blue uniform right after graduating from Paris Island. The insignia next to him is the unofficial insignia of the Marine Corps' 9th Defense Battalion, known as the Fighting Ninth. Before we get too far into this, and I'm not going to answer the question yet, but I'm just curious, how many of you have ever heard or are familiar with the term pogey bait? Does that ring any bells with anybody in here? I've heard of pogey. Okay, close. Military. Close. So here, here's the good news. In about five more minutes, all will be answered, and you too will know what pogey bait is and why or what Jack H. McCall Sr. is called pogey bait. Uh, so let me take you back, you know, with that reference made a few minutes ago about December 6, 1941. Let me just take you back in time to Middle Tennessee, specifically Franklin, Tennessee, and Williamson County. That is where my father grew up. That is where I originally am from. Uh, you know, for those of you who have been to Franklin or been to Middle Tennessee, you know the town is almost like something preserved in history. And structurally it is. If you go to downtown Franklin, You'll see the picture behind me is taken in the late 1940s, so roughly about eight or nine years after you know, the, the start of this story takes place. 
in downtown Franklin, other than missing a water tank over the town square, it looks pretty much the same as it did in this photo. You know, it was a very bucolic county and a very small town. Uh, the entire county populace of Williamson County was between 15 and 20,000 people. Hard to believe if you go there now, it certainly is not that number. Uh, town Square in Franklin, structurally, the way it looks in 2023 is more or less exactly structurally, physically, the way it looked in 1941. So here are just a couple of typical scenes from, from life around the Town Square. Uh, these actually are both taken next to uh, the main cafe in town, a place called the West Point Cafe. You see that little boy standing out there with a, a 1930s or early 40s vintage car behind him. Uh, but you also see a bunch of young kids, probably high school kids, probably Franklin High School kids, who are enjoying some malts and shakes inside the Banner Cafe. Sorry, inside the West Point Cafe. And one of them often was a fellow by the name of Jack McCall. Now, how did Jack McCall go from that bucolic, you know, almost Andy Griffith-esque life to scenes like this. This will be what I'm primarily going to be talking about today. And obviously the transition is one that shook him as it shook everybody who went through World War II. So to begin with how Jack McCall fits into those scenes of combat and violence I showed you a minute ago, these are all pictures of what it was like for Jack growing up as a young kid in Franklin. Uh, born in 1922, my favorite picture I think of all of these is the one of the group picture of him. Uh, he's got his hand in his little fedora. This fedora actually pictures in about three photos here. Look at that look on his face. Have you ever seen a more smart aleck looking kid in your life? This was my dad. He was an inveterate practical jokester from the time he was born, and these practical jokes got him in a lot of trouble. Plot spoiler, it might have something to do with how he earned the name of Pogi Bait, but again, we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. So there he is in sixth grade with a bunch of his, his buddies. Uh, he ended up being the captain of the Franklin High School basketball team, the co-captain of the football team with a fellow by the name of David Gentry. And you see them in the group photo underneath Coach W.C. Yates. You see a very nice picture of him looking kind of suave uh, from his senior year in high school wearing that fedora. Now, that fedora is also perched on the head of a kind of loose looking fella kind of leaned back in this old fliver. And I don't know if you can read it really well on the screen behind me, but what the door says is don't shove gals. As I said, my dad had a sense of humor. He also had kind of a high opinion of himself, and he clearly thought had a higher opinion of himself if he thought any girls were going to beat themselves up to get into that rattle trap. <laughs> so, so this is his life. He graduates from Franklin High in May of 1941. He is working uh, as a dry goods salesman for a warehouse down on 2nd Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. His father was in the dry goods business and ran a national stores uh, in Nashville, later one in Franklin. He's thinking about getting his act together, and after he makes a little bit of money, he thinks he's going to apply to University of Tennessee and become a volunteer because, hey, who doesn't love the Tennessee Vols? This is his future until December 7th, and that day that she'll live in infamy, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor 82 years ago tomorrow. And so on that day is a Sunday. He and the family had just gotten home from First Methodist Church in Franklin, when they heard from a neighbor, you need to turn on the radio, there's something going on and it sounds really bad. They flipped on the radio. They're all then trying to figure out where is Hawaii exactly, where is Pearl Harbor, but the one thing Jack McCall knew, there's a war on. He has a brother who's already a sergeant in the Marine Corps. His brother had said, don't wait around to get drafted if this war kicks off. You need to join the Marines and be a man like me. So on December 8th, Monday, Jack and a bunch of his buddies get probably into that fliver or one looking a lot like it, and they went in droves from Franklin to Nashville, and he went to the old customs house that still stands on Broadway, went down to the Marine Recruiting Agency, and he said, I want to be a Marine. Sergeant said, fill out these papers, we'll be back in touch, uh, come back for a physical, and get ready, we'll give you about a month, but come December 31st, you know, you'll be getting tickets from us that will send you then on a train to Paris Island, South Carolina, and that's exactly what happened. So, beginning of January, literally January 1st, 1942, Jack McCall and a bunch of other young guys show up at a place called Yemassee Junction, which is a few miles outside of Paris Island, South Carolina. In my dad's words, he said, I knew, pardon my language, there will be a little fussing cussing here. My dad said, I knew there would be hell to pay when that young cocky corporal got on that train and told us all who was going to be in charge. And that was the beginning of things. So he made it through on an expedited schedule. Typically, the training of, of Marine recruits or boots at Paris Island 
is longer than what he got. He basically got training for about six weeks, but in that time, he lost roughly 20 pounds. And so the picture of him that you see here, he, he looks so young at this picture. He was loaned a pair of dress blues after he graduated, so this is his post-graduation picture in his dress blues. But he's also in the group photo, and I'm not sure if you can see it particularly well. Okay, if you look, if you see, starting with Wells, go Gooden, Lowry, go one, two, three rows up, and you'll see him standing there with his ears sticking out. He has lost about 20 or 25 pounds. But there was one time when that sense of humor of his and his hunger got the better of him, and that is how he got the name Pogi Bait. Uh, I know you're dying to ask. I know you've been curious all along. What is a pogey bait or who is a pogey bait? Well, he's a pogey bait, and here's the reason why. So one night as he is going through his training, desperately hungry, he is basically told, you will need to guard a small, basically like marine version of a, of a post exchange or a base exchange. It's a little place where you can buy and sell goodies and things like that. And he's out there. Nobody else is around. It's pitch dark. He decides he's curious and he wants to look and see what they actually are selling inside. He finds an unopened box of Baby Ruth candy bars. And he loves Baby Ruths. And he's really hungry and he's lost a lot of weight. And guess what? He makes those Baby Ruths disappear. So the next day they're doing physical training and in the middle of these exertions he keels over. The drill instructors kind of go bananas. They're like, what's happened to this boot? You know, does he have heat stroke, heat prostration? What's happened to him? They haul him off to the dispensary, and the medic says, well, I can find nothing wrong with this man other than the fact that his blood sugar content is off the charts. How in the world could this be? And he has to fess up. I ate a box of candy bars last night. The drill instructors went crazy. They called him all kinds of four-letter words, including pogey bait hound. And his buddies heard that, and they said, oh, McCall's just a pogey bait hound, and later they shortened it to pogey bait. So... That was a tip off to me as I was growing up. My dad got married kind of later in life and I was born when he was already uh, about 49 years old. But I knew his Marine buddies would always be the ones who'd call because when I picked up the phone and say, hey little Nikki, is pogey bait there? <laughs> Everybody else asked for Jack or your old man or your dad or something like that. But the first thing they'd say is, hey little Nikki, where's pogey bait? Yeah, get your old man on the phone. It's like, hey dad, there's those guys on the phone again calling you that weird name. Oh, must be my ring buddies. They would get on. They would talk forever. But as I learned what his life was like, I understand why it was such a joyous thing for them to be able to talk in their older ages and share these experiences. And a lot of it goes directly to what we're going to be talking about here over the course of this talk. So after they graduate in February 1942, you've now got this platoon of young Marines. They obviously are ready to be dispatched and, and do whatever mission the Marine Corps has in mind for them. And this is going to be a big mission. February 1942, things are absolutely not looking at all good for the Allies. It is a mess out there. The Navy and U.S. military are forced on December 7th, 1941, to dig into their files and their plans to figure out what we need to do to respond to this major Japanese aggression. The war plan that had been prepared in advance was called War Plan Orange. Uh, it had been in existence for some years, updated yearly, and this was going to be the primary defense plan that the U.S. intended to roll out to go against the Japanese after Pearl Harbor. Part of it entailed the exact reason why the 9th Defense Battalion and its sister battalions existed and why Jack McCall would be a part of a defense battalion in particular. So this is going to require a little moment of explanation about what this kind of unit is and why it exists. As you look at the map, obviously, there's a vast amount of Pacific Ocean area to be covered. And the Japanese have already taken a good bit of it, and they're looking at taking more. It is absolutely clear under War Plan Orange that if the American military is going to push the Japanese back, be able to get back to the Philippines, which is also under Japanese attack within hours after Pearl Harbor, if it is going to defend Wake, also to be acquired by the Japanese within a matter of days after Pearl Harbor, defend Midway, defend all these other islands where the Navy had either you know, fully uploaded or, or partial stations and places where they could put airfields and harbors, they are going to need to have some kind of unit that can go there, a self-contained unit, something that has the artillery, the infantry power, maybe tanks, everything needed to defend these islands against Japanese troops and hold them so that the Navy can use them as refueling stations and continue the advance across the Pacific. So in 1938, knowing this is the Navy's need, 
the leadership of the Marine Corps invents something called a base defense battalion, in time shortened to b defense battalions. And the Ninth Defense is one of the new defense battalions. It is stood up on the 1st of February, 1942. And all those young Marines you saw in that picture, 90% of the members of my dad's graduating platoon at Paris Island end up in the Ninth Defense Battalion, which is being formed at Paris Island and is about to go to Norfolk, Virginia for some new exciting adventures. This will give you an idea briefly of what this battalion looks like. These are very unusual units. For most of you who have read about the military, have been in the military, you know that battalions, which are roughly anywhere between like 400 to maybe 1,000 troops typically, typically have one orientation. They're a tank battalion, they're an infantry battalion, they're an artillery battalion, supply battalion, anti-aircraft, whatever. This thing has it all. And again, it is because the primary mission of defense battalion is this is gonna be the force we're gonna place on an island. And it's gonna defend against all comers, obviously particularly Japanese, but it's gonna have the firepower, it's gonna have the manpower, it's gonna have everything it needs by and large to defend and hold on this island long enough so that the Navy either can reinforce it or that the Navy can build up its own resupply and fueling stations there to continue the advance across the Pacific. And so as a result, they've got heavy artillery. You see in the upper uh, left-hand corner a very large cannon. That's a 155 millimeter GPF. It dates to 1916. Uh, when the service in 1917, it was largely built by the French. Uh, so this is World War I vintage, but it still is a powerful weapon. On the opposite flanking side, you see a lar another large cannon. That's a 90 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. Uh, they had searchlights. They had some of the first ground-mounted radar in use in the military, and military, certainly in the Marine Corps. And they also had a platoon of light tanks. You see a sample of one of the small M3 tanks with a Marine standing next to it. Ultimately, they start out with about seven or eight. By the time they actually got really into service later on New Georgia, they had about 15 of them. So this is not a, this is a very unusual unit. It's also a very large unit. It has, at one point in time, roughly 1,300 troops. And so that is off, you know, when you look at certain other battalions, it's almost two or three times the size of a lot of them. And it is commanded by a lieutenant colonel. So after the Ninth Defense boards this transport and sets sail, they are told on the ship, you are going to Cuba. Specifically, you're going to a place that we're all familiar with since 9-11, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. This has been in the custody of the U.S. Navy since the Spanish-American War. It is one of the largest installations for the U.S. military in the Caribbean. Uh, and it's a major place from which we are defending uh, oil tankers coming in and out of Venezuela, uh, other supply and transport ships going out of the Caribbean and uh, the South Atlantic from German U-boats. So there is a mission for the Ninth Defense, and that is to be coast defense, as well as a training mission, which is you are now being formed. We're going to actually teach you what your job really is. And so they then go to Guantanamo Bay, and they're there from February until October. Now, they actually do have kind of an unusual adventure. Remember, I mentioned a minute ago about U-boats those being German submarines. Uh, they actually may be one of the only units in the Marine Corps that I know of that actually found itself engaging, in a sense, against both sides of the axis, not just the Japanese, but also the Germans. And here's how that came about. This submarine you see is uh, Unterseeboater U-Boat 96. Uh, it was engaged in a fight off the coast of Cuba with a Canadian ship that sank it. And the Canadians captured about 38 German U-boat crewmen. And they said, well, what are we gonna do with them? Well, it's too far away from Canada. Uh, we still got duties out here. We have other ships to protect against other prowling U-boats, uh, but we're not too far away from Cuba. Maybe we can sail our ship to Guantanamo Bay and get rid of these recalcitrant, really grouchy, angry German U-boat sailors who are all washed up. And so they did. And in the end, the Ninth Defense found themselves having the duty for several weeks of guarding these guys. Apparently, it's very unpleasant duty. The Marines do not like the Germans. The Germans do not like the Marines. There were a lot of uh, cheap shot and harder things probably thrown at each other, but eventually, after they guarded them, the Germans were shipped off to France. So, sorry, shipped off to, uh, to Miami. So, in that sense, you know, I don't know of a lot of Marine units that really had direct contact with German units or German troops, but this is one instance where they did. And so, in a sense, I guess the Ninth Defense actually found themselves fighting a war against the Germans as well as they would later and soon enough find one against the Japanese. So I did mention they went to war against the Japanese. That war begins to take on in earnest in October of 1942. The then battalion commander, who you see the picture of, Colonel David Nimmer, uh, 
called his officers together for an officer's call in late September 1942. And they're all sitting there, and he looks really kind of grim and serious, and he says, I just want to let you know that I have asked Marine Corps headquarters for duty. We're not staying here on Cuba much longer. I told him I want the most dangerous and demanding duty we can ask for, and we have got it. And as one of the junior officers told me, he said, you could have heard a pin drop. And so, again, as was before, none of the enlisted Marines know where they're going. They just know they've been told, get your gear, get everything ready, draw rifles, draw ammunition, draw everything you need. You're getting on a transport, and we're going somewhere. And we mean business. And so they end up boarding a ship called the USS Kenmore. That's the transport ship you see behind me. It was not a particularly great vessel. In fact, most of the Marines referred to it as the USS Kilmore. Uh, it was not a great ride across the ocean. There were threats of German submarines. Once they got through the Panama Canal, there were threats of Japanese submarines. But eventually in time, uh, they end up in Numia, New Caledonia, uh, which is the major installation that is being used by the Americans, least from the Free French, to supply and resupply Guadalcanal. The U.S. has been fighting at Guadalcanal since the 7th of August, 1942. It is now late October, early November. By this point in time, the battle is swinging very much in favor of the U.S., but the primary defenders of the 1st Marine Division, and they are flat worn out. The ones who have not been wounded have suffered viciously from malaria. A large proportion of the Marines are sick, they're tired, they're worn out. They've all lost considerable weight. Uh, and it's been a brutal battle, so there is a need to reinforce them. Part of the reinforcements will be the 9th Defense Battalion. And so they receive their first blooding on Guadalcanal. Uh, behind me again, you actually see one of those large French-made 155-millimeter GPF set up on its wheels. Next to it, you see a gun crew in a position that's one of the large 90-millimeter anti-aircraft guns. They saw a little action against Japanese ships. They did actually see action with Japanese infiltrators. And in fact, my father at one point, one of the scariest parts of his life was being cut off and surrounded by a group of Japanese infiltrators and having to holler for reinforcement over the telephone. Uh, fortunately enough, guys are able to hear his, his cry for help on that field telephone and got down and saved his life. But that's one of about five times I figured that he almost died. But he survived. Ninth Defense gets great field training. And that goes on until about May 1943. The Battle of Guadalcanal actually was more or less resolved by February 1943, but there continue to be significant Japanese air raids. And so they've been there for a while. Uh, Colonel Nimmer is replaced by Colonel Bill Shire. That's a photo of Colonel Shire. When he's in a good mood, he's called, uh, he's just called Old Bill. When he's in a bad mood, which is more frequent, he's called Wild Bill. And you can see from that look, he's a man that you don't mess around with. Uh, my father is also in this picture. This is a picture of the part of the unit he was with, the headquarters of the 155 millimeter group. That is the unit to which all those really big GPFs are assigned. And my dad is the one on the top row at the far left standing with his hands behind him. Uh, by this point in time, he's lost another 20 pounds. So he is turning into a very skinny young man at this point in time. He is all of 20 years old. Uh, here's some more pictures of the 9th on Guadalcanal. At least this one over here on the left-hand side. Now, this is actually going to take place a few weeks later. This is what replaces the old 155 millimeter French-made World War I age guns. They now start getting a brand new gun that's called an M1 155 millimeter long tom. These things are much more modern. Uh, they have greater range. They are easier to move around. And the 9th Defense Battalion's 155 millimeter group to which my father is assigned as a gunner receives eight of these big monsters. Well, any time you're in the military and somebody gives you new equipment, you know you're getting it for a reason. It's not simply because they like you or they think that you're due changing out your old jalopy for a new jalopy. They intend you to have that thing to use it. And that is exactly what is about to happen with them getting this new equipment in May of 1943. The next Allied offensive is coming up, and this is now aiming at a group of islands also in the Solomon Islands, like Guadalcanal, but roughly 150 to 200 miles north of Guadalcanal called the New Georgia Group. The action here centers around the fact that at a place called Munda Point, the Japanese have built a very large airfield that is large enough to rival Henderson Field, the field that the Japanese were building on Guadalcanal that caused the Marines to invade in August 1942 in the first place. And not only are Japanese air raids coming from a large island called Rabaul in the New Britain Group, which is several hundred miles 
to the west of Guadalcanal, but there are also indications that Jap some of these Japanese air raiders that are hitting after the Guadalcanal land campaign is over are coming from this new airstrip under construction on New Georgia. So it doesn't take long for the Americans to say, you know, how are we going to be able to effectively hold on to Guadalcanal if the Japanese are now building up this new position just north of us? You know, 150 miles may seem a lot by boat or when you're having to march on land, but by an aircraft, that's not that long. It's not that far away. So it becomes imperative then for the new defenders of Guadalcanal to look at forming a task force to head up to go invade New Georgia, take care of that Japanese airfield, and take care of a large number of Japanese defenders there. And the name for that, the code name for that, is Operation Toenails. And so on June the 30th, 1943, the 9th Defense Battalion, along with several of Marine Raider units and also an Army Division, the 43rd Infantry Division, ended up loading up on landing craft. And the photo you see is of the 9th Defense about to land on an island that you see on the map just south of New Georgia. That island is called Rendova. The idea is all those big, brand new 155 millimeter <laughs> long toms are going to park themselves on the northern tip of Rendova near a small harbor they have perfect range to hit that Japanese airfield. So the idea is, let's land the night defense on Rendova. Let our infantry forces from the 43rd Infantry Division, let the Marine Raiders prowl around and land on the rest of New Georgia. We can just let that Japanese airfield get taken out by the night defense battalion with their long range guns. What a great idea. And it works, but not without certain things happening first. And so, June the 30th, July the 1st, the 9th Defense Battalion lands on Randova. They land at a place that was a former plantation run by Lever Brothers. You know, we're all familiar with that name from soaps and cleaning products. Uh, it actually, at the time, was a British-owned corporation. It had leasing rights over many of the islands in the South Pacific because they grew coconuts, and obviously coconut oil was a prime product uh, for a lot of their cleaning solutions and soaps. And so when you see the ship landing, that actually is at a former Lever Brothers port on the northern tip of Rendova. Uh, using big caterpillars, they pull the 150 thighs through the muck and the mud, and they get them in position. So all eight of them, within a matter of hours, are lined up under palm trees, you know, in a pretty secure place. As far as I know, the Japanese don't know they're there, although there were some Japanese defenders who were killed in Rendova. But they don't think the Japanese know that they have these big guns ready to start opening up and bombarding <coughs> Munda Field. They were wrong. The Japanese did know they were there. Before the Japanese come back, though, and show the Americans how much they know, uh, we often heard about, you know, the fog of war and things like this. This is an example of that. Uh, the transport my father went over was not actually one of those LSTs, that large landing craft you saw in the earlier photo. He and the command group of the 155 millimeter group and the 9th Defense Headquarters were all on a ship that was called the USS Macaulay. It was also known as the Wacky Mac. It was apparently a very strange ship. It also has a very strange fate. After my dad and his leadership basically get in their landing craft and, and sail away from the Macaulay, uh, one of the first Japanese air raids hits. It's a small one compared to what will follow, but it nevertheless, a Japanese dive bomber hits and damages the Macaulay. And so there's some fear that it's going to sink, but the crew gets the ship under control, fixes the problem. There's still a lot of fire and smoke coming out of it. Uh, but late in the afternoon, it also gets kind of misty and foggy in that part of the Solomon Islands. Uh, a little bit later that night, there is a squadron of U.S. Navy PT boats that are sailing around. Uh, and up ahead of them in the murk and the dim and everything, they see what appears to be a Japanese cruiser, so they launch two torpedoes and they sink it. And a PT boat commander who fires the torpedoes gets the Navy Cross, which is extremely high metal. He's a real hero until sometime in late 1945 when we have crushed Japan. We're now beginning to re review all the Japanese Navy records and we're asking about that Japanese cruise that we sank in on July the 1st, 1943 in the water outside Rendo and the Japanese went, cruiser? What cruiser? We didn't have any cruisers there. Oh, but wait a minute, the U.S. Navy did have a ship there. It was called the USS Macaulay. Yeah, the PT boat skipper sank a U.S. ship. And he got the Navy Cross. I understand that medal was taken back from him. Uh, that was not happy. I said the Wacky Mac, it earned its name from beginning to end. It was a very strange ship and probably had one of the stranger fates in U.S. military history. And my dad is lucky to survive not being on that ship when it went down. 
Well, having that first Japanese airstrike on July 1st, as I said, was just a harbinger of what was to follow. And the next day was a really bad day. It was probably the worst day in the history of the 9th Defense Battalion. It was certainly a black day for the U.S. forces landing on New Georgia and Rendova. A major Japanese air raid took place on the 2nd of July, 1943. Several hundred casualties, several Marines of the 9th Defense Battalion were killed. Uh, quite a few of them were seriously wounded. Uh, there is a man who is fairly legendary in Marine Corps history. His name is David Shoup. David Shoup, several months after this, in November 1943, ends up being the only survivor of five Marines to receive the Medal of Honor for combat on the island of Tarawa. Uh, Shoup ultimately is the Commandant Marine Corps and retires as a general. He is a very brave man. He is very well respected by people who know the Marines, and he was loved by his Marines. But he was there as an observer assisting uh, the higher headquarters of the 9th Defense Battalion on Rendova. On that time, he was there when the air raid occurred, and his diary for that day says, gross sights everywhere, arms and legs moving in all directions. I nearly crapped out myself. And so I think it says a lot if you've got somebody who is that battle seasoned, that tough, and that disciplined, as Colonel Dave Shoup is writing that in his diary, he, that's telling you how bad this air raid was. And it was. My father had nightmares about it for the rest of his life. Uh, several of my father's best friends who were assigned to another battery, i.e. another company of the 9th Defense, lost one of their very best friends. And every year uh, on Veterans Day, the, the fathers are dead, the sons are still alive, they live outside Chicago, they will travel to Charlie Einicke's grave outside Chicago and lay flowers on it. So he is not forgotten. That was a really bad day. Uh, as I said, 200 casualties, quite a few dead. Uh, supplies of ammunition, including a large d dynamite dump for the Navy Seabees, got blown. If you see that smoke and fire building up in the sky, that came from the explosion of roughly 200 pounds of, of CB explosives. People just disintegrated. Apparently, a bulldozer was just blown to pieces. But the Japanese knew that even though it had done this much damage, they knew they had not finished them off, and they said, we need to come back. And the day they decided to come back and finish off the attack is another auspicious day because they decided to finish the job on the 4th of July. Now. Another reason why that attack succeeded. Uh, first off, the 9th Defense had radar, as we know, but the radar was not working for some reason that day. Uh, they did not have early warning of the Japanese aircraft coming in. The other problem, though, is as the Japanese are coming over Rendova Mountain, which is an extinct volcano, to see those nice targets at the area of that little harbor, which became known as Suicide Point because of that air raid, the guys on the ground looked up and they see planes flying along that seemingly are coming in from an area that they knew that American B-25 Mitchell bombers had gone out to attack the Japanese over New Georgia proper. So what they see coming back at them, or they think is coming back at them, is they think that flight of B-25s. And the B-25 looks like that. It's the one right up here. On the other hand, the Japanese also were using other types of bombers called Betty's Sally's and Nell's that also tended to look an awful lot like a B-25 if you're looking without binoculars at a plane flying over at more than 10,000 feet. And those are Japanese bombers that were misidentified as American planes because the radar wasn't operating, they didn't have long range detection. And those explain in part why that day was so bad. Now, when the Japanese came back on the 4th of July, the radar was up and working. People really had their eyes trained. They now knew not, if you see an American bomber, be sure it's an American bomber and don't just assume it's an American bomber. The 90 millimeter guns were now in place and you had eight big guns that could shoot to an extremely high altitude that were commanded by a captain by the name of Bill Tracy who you'll see in this photo. Bill Tracy is the guy who's got his hand like this, which you can't see in his hand as he has a stopwatch there. Bill Tracy's son is a very good friend of mine. He said that his dad, even when he was a young boy, was just obsessed with efficiency and speed. His favorite birthday game for his sons was to take that stopwatch out and have them do races and sack races and stuff like that. And he was always timing and, and bringing them on to figure out which brother could be faster than the other brother. So this goes all the way back to 1943. His battery shot down an entire Japanese squadron of 13 planes with 88 shells in something like three to five minutes, which is an incredible record. I think it's in Guinness Book of World Records. At least it was 20 or 30 years ago when I last looked. That broke the back of the Japanese air attacks. The Japanese continued to attack with sporadic air raids while the 9th Defense was on New Georgia, but that one really was, was kind of quits. 
How am I looking on time out of curiosity, Lisa? You got about, it's uh, 20, 25 Okay, so we're still good on time. Uh, on the 17th and 18th of January, sorry, 17th and 18th of July, 1943, with the air raids not working, the Japanese decide they're going to try another effort to break through and smash through the Allied positions on New Georgia. This time they're going to do it with an all-out infantry assault on that 43rd Infantry Division. Uh, it also involved trying to attack the rear areas of the division, which were at a place called Zanana Beach. Uh, among the defenders of Zanana Beach were not just the Army soldiers, but it was also a group of anti-aircraft gunners from the 9th Defense, including two privates, John Wantuck and Meyer Rothschild. Uh, their lieutenant, knowing that something was imminent, or at least just sensing it, said, you know, our, our big anti-aircraft guns are good for shooting down airplanes, but they're not really great for defending against Japanese intruders or Japanese patrols. And so at his urging, Wan Tuck and Rothschild found a Army ordnance site where they were getting rid of, of like various pieces of broken or battered equipment, and they scrounged up a couple of machine guns. And these guys basically set up positions to defend the back of the anti-aircraft site from a Japanese attack. And boy, did that happen. Uh, something like the number of like 200, 300 Japanese attacked them that night. Uh, the position was saved. It was saved entirely because of the heroism of Wantuck and Rothschild. When Rothschild was found the next morning, he supposedly had something like 10 or 15 saber and bayonet cuts all of themselves and multiple wounds, but he survived. The same could not be said for Wantuck, but there are somewhere between 15 and 20 dead Japanese all around his position. Both of them received the Navy Cross. So, again, remember, these guys are not infantry. They are artillery, they're radar, they're any aircraft. They're, they're not supposed to be seeing direct combat, but they did. And that's just one of the examples of, of the kind of heroism that they had to find themselves mustering up in instances and situations where they never thought it would happen. So anyway, back to Munda Point. You can see this photo. This photo was taken in May of 1943. So, you know, roughly six or seven weeks before the night defense and the, milita and the American military get to Rendova and get to Munda Field. Uh, and it's still pretty jungly. You can see the area, you know, clearly where the airstrip is. You can see there's some bombing. You can see, you know, little light spots. Those indicate bomb craters from where the Allies had figured out the airfield already is and already starting to attack it. So this will show you the difference in time between May of 1943 in late July and August 1943, when those eight big artillery pieces firing from Rendova did their work, it's a pretty stark difference. I mean, it's completely denuded. It really, it looks, it no longer looks like a jungle. It looks almost like just a kind of weird landscape with, with stubs of trees sticking up. And that's the result of eight guns firing significant amounts of time, shooting 95 pound shells with a little guy by the name of Pogie Mate McCall standing by, helping ram these shells in to fire them at these long distances. Uh, Munda Point fell, Rent, New Georgia fell, and once that happened, the night defense then moving their guns from Rendova to several other locations, uh, including all around Munda Field to defend it, including the anti-aircraft guns from Rendova being moved over to help defend the new, under new management, Munda Point Airfield uh, to keep it safe from Japanese aircraft. Uh, and so the ninth, that they thought they now were going to have a little bit of break, were wrong because about a week or so after they moved and consolidated their new positions around the Munda Point airfield, every time they try to have chow at night, they now are actually able to have hot chow. They now have mess facilities set up so they're no longer eating things from packages and cans. Every time they get ready to eat, shells start exploding all around them and they basically lose their dinner. And this goes on for several days and they're furious. And they finally figure out that on another island, called Banga, there are two Japanese naval guns that are called Pistol Peep, and their sole mission seems to be to keep the 9th Defense Battalion from having a steady diet. And so that goes on for several days. Uh, several efforts are made, and even a group of Fiji uh, commandos that were raised from the British colony of Fiji went and tried to capture the Japanese guns, and that didn't work. I think it took uh, Navy dive bombers working them over before the, the two guns finally quit firing. At that point in time, my dad said, no more cold chow. Happy days to us all. Uh, a few weeks later, the Japanese now are largely retreating from New Georgia and going to an adjacent island called Kolim Bangara. Uh, there is roughly 15,000 Japanese defenders. This is where, if you've ever heard the term island hopping, this is an example where island hopping starts to be put into action. 
the American military planners know, okay, you know, we could do like we already did at New Georgia or like we did at, Guant at Guadalcanal. We, we could try to attack this island, you know, but we know there are already major Japanese forces there. You can see from this drawing, it's a huge rocky place. I mean, it's basically a volcano, uh, a dormant volcano with steep slopes. They know that to land on this island would be a real challenge to take it. And typically you need to have anywhere from two to three number, you know, two to three times the number of invaders to take on a defense. So they say, well, we don't need to do this. You know, let's just cut them off. We can bombard them with aircraft. We can bombard them with guns and we don't have to land it. We'll just let this thing basically be like a grape that rots on the vine and we'll move on to the islands on the other side, which is what they did. Less occupied island called Vela La Vela. So the American troops then moved to Vela La Vela leave Colin Bangara surrounded, and then they take the night defense and says, you guys have big guns that can shoot long distances and fire 95 pound shells. You can make their life a living you know what. And they did. And so for several weeks then, the guns of the night defense move up and bombard Colin Bangara. And at some point in August 1943, a Navy plane is flying over the island saying, we see Japanese landing craft and they're all leaving. And basically in large part between American aircraft bombing the island and the night defense guns, it really forced the Japanese defenders to leave. So chalk up another point for the night defense. Occupation duties. So for then for some months they are left basically consolidating the position under Georgia. This just gives you an idea of what their living conditions were like. I don't know about you, but I'm sure a lot of you are fans of MASH or have seen MASH. I look at these photos and it really reminds me of something like a, a Pacific Island version of MASH occurring in World War II and not in the Pacific. Uh, kind of grungy conditions, a lot of mud, a lot of muck, uh, a lot of gigantic land crabs. The fellow you see in the photo uh, coming out of this tent is a fellow named Dave Biggie Slater. Dave was named Biggie for good reason. He was six foot seven. He had an absolute passionate aversion to spiders and land crabs. And one of the four funniest stories I have in the book is about the night when he's in that tent operating his radio. He was a chief radio man for the night defense. And he hears things scuttling around, and he finds that that dugout area is full of land crabs. <laughs> that was not a good day for Biggie Slater. And, and I think he had nightmares about that until his dying day, too. So I'm going to try to power through the next few slides and still leave plenty of time at the end for, for, for Q&A. <clears throat> the 9th Defense Battalion guys, including my dad, got really excited because at one point in the fall of 1943, they had people fitting them out for new uniforms including wool uniforms. They're in the South Pacific. Why, why are you going to wear wool uniforms? Well, there's one possible answer. Where is a place near the South Pacific where you actually could be comfortable wearing wool? New Zealand, Australia. Th these are nice uniforms. They're like dress uniforms. They're like the uniforms you saw with the picture of the platoon. Uh, you look really sharp at them particularly around civilians and dignitaries. Uh, hey guys, if we're getting fitted for these new uniforms, maybe we're gonna go to Australia or maybe go to New Zealand. So all the guys get really excited until their higher headquarters decides, well, you guys have the reputation of being real scroungers and, and, and rustlers and fighters and road agents, and we really don't need people like you to be going into downtown Brisbane or downtown Auckland, New Zealand. You're gonna embarrass the American military. No, we have a better place in mind for you. So uh, what they find they're going to is not gonna be some really nice island like New Zealand or Australia, even though they thought they were going there. Instead, they go to a place called Benica, which is on the Russell Islands. Have you ever heard of the Russell Islands? Nobody has, and there's a good reason for it. Part of my French, they're hell holes. They are not real great. They are on the outside of Guadalcanal. So they are now going back to an island very much like the island they had spent so much of 1942 and, late ni and early 1943 fighting for. And when my father told me about their time on Benica, he often would say, when son, you know, they had us camping in a swamp. And I would just look at him and it's like, Dad, a swamp, come on, you're pulling my leg. You know, look, you're in the American Marine Corps. They're not going to put you in a swamp. And he'd look at me, he's like, son, don't you think I know what a swamp is, boy? Well, then when I started researching this, Dave Slater, the fellow who we saw a few minutes ago, sent me some photographs, including this photo right here. I ask you, look at it. What does that look like? You can see tents. You can see a lot of palm trees. You can see a couple of Marines standing where their pith helmets in front. And between them and the tents, it looks like swamp. My dad was many things. He was not a liar. And his eyesight was very, very good. So 
they are left on this place to kind of rest and recreate, uh, if the much you can do on that, in an island that's largely a swamp. Although there were opportunities to have some fun, they got to form baseball teams, uh, they had good sports, they had pretty decent recreation. They had Red Cross girls who were called donut dollies who came over and made donuts and ran a little Red Cross hut. And so there's a photo is my dad, some of his buddies with a couple of the Red Cross ladies. Uh, who were the first white women they had actually seen probably in two years. So that alone was like a novel thing for them. But again, once you've been put into R&R, you know you're not going to be there just because they feel sorry for you or you've had a hard time or, gee, you know, we just really love you guys. You're a great bunch of mugs. Uh, you're going there because something else is going to be in mind, and that was the next thing to come. Before that, though, my dad found a new hobby. <clears throat> yeah, you're looking at a picture of a hand grenade. So, so can you guess what my father's hobby was? He found, particularly in New Georgia, that there were a lot of unexploded Japanese hand grenades that had been left by the defenders in the caves and the bunkers around Munda Point. And he said, what a great idea. I think I can take these things and I can deactivate them and I can sell them to the, to the Navy swabbies and the Army grunts for $25 a grenade. And he did. He made pretty good money on that, which he lost in poker games, but that's another story. Uh, now, when he told me how he deactivated these grenades, this is why I say, kids, do not try this at home. I've told you about many of my father's virtues. Sometimes common sense was not necessarily high on that list. Uh, because the way that he deactivated these grenades, as you see the, the, the illustration here, you would unscrew that stem at the top, and then when it popped out, you could turn it upside down, shake out the powder inside of that. Great. So far, so good. You then take it and you fill a helmet full of gasoline or kerosene, and then you put a couple of deactivated grenades into that helmet full of kerosene or gasoline, and then you put it underneath your cot in your tent. Oh. Well, you smoke cigarettes because you love cigarettes. I don't know why my dad did not blow himself to kingdom come, really. I mean, I, lovely man. This is not a hobby I recommend to anybody. Unfortunately, I don't think there are any Japanese grenades rolling around Knoxville, Tennessee, so end of story. Now, as I said, you know, when you go into R&R, this for a reason. It's not just because the higher command loves you or think that you're entitled to a break. This was to get them ready for the next campaign, which is Operation Forager. We are now looking in the summer of 1944 at getting even closer to Japan proper, and the way we're going to do this is to go to the Mariana Islands. We need bases for a giant B-29 bombers which currently are being based in China. But there are problems with those bases. Those bases are close to areas of Japanese occupation. The Japanese have already made several offensives to take over those airfields, so the airfields are not in a particularly safe spot. The airfields have the range to get to parts of southern Japan, but not northern or central <coughs> Japan, so we need a place that can get us greater range for these big bombers. And also, Guam is American territory. You know, I mentioned Wake Island in the Philippines coming under attack within a matter of hours after Pearl Harbor. So did Guam, which was captured fairly quickly. Uh, one of the things that was very curious, as I learned from researching about my dad's life, is there was actually a family from Franklin, Tennessee, that lived on Guam before World War II. The father was the superintendent of schools. They were all captured by the Japanese and sent basically to a, a, a Guamanian version of a concentration camp, and the father died in Japanese custody. But there are plenty of Guamanians who loved America. It had been, you know, much like the Philippines, an American control since the end of the Spanish-American War. And the Guamanian citizens would sing this little song about Sam, Sam, dear old Uncle Sam, will you please come back to Guam? And when they'd see the American bombers and planes flying overhead, every time it happened, they'd sing that song to themselves. So they wanted to be liberated so badly. <clears throat> and for our own military and strategic reasons, but also for good reasons, we were about to have the chance to make that wish come true. So then in July 1944, the Ninth Defense ultimately moved in. They were involved in the liberation of Guam. There's a large part of the story there that I think I may just leave for another time. And if you're interested in reading in the book about it, uh, it was a tough battle. It was one that my father and his buddies talked far less about than either life in Cuba, life in Guadalcanal, the experiences uh, on New Georgia and Rendova, and even the experiences on Benica. Uh, it was just very challenging. It was very difficult. Uh, they basically had a lot of active combat even after the islands were declared fully liberated because by the fall of 1944, there were still between 5,000 and 6,000 Japanese defenders who had not been killed or captured. 
and no longer needing those big heavy guns to take on the Japanese forces, the 155 millimeter group basically was turned into infantry. They went into patrolling and they spent the better part of the next four or five months going out looking for these Japanese. And it was brutal. It was, some of the words and some of the expressions used are really reminiscent of what a later generation went through in Vietnam. So it's not the prettiest part of the story of my father's heritage, but it was certainly the way that he ended his combat in World War II. After that, December 1944, right before Christmas, the Marines doing a lot of things to, to reorganize their artillery. They say, we're not going to keep 155 millimeter guns with defense battalions. We're taking them all back. We're gonna form new heavy artillery units. We don't need the 155 millimeter group night defense. You're going back home. We're going to send you to Hawaii. After that, you're going to San Francisco, and then your units could be broken up, and all you guys get to go on leave. So that was a great day for my father. He ended up landing uh, in San Francisco on New Year's Eve, 1945, and it was the happiest fourth, you know, the happiest New Year's Eve he ever spent. The rest of his time, he was spent in training and preparing for the invasion of Japan when he heard about the atomic bombs. You know, regardless of how most of us feel about nuclear war and the threat, he thought it was also one of the happiest days of his life. He said, because we knew we were going to survive. So the defense battalions, as I said, that the 155 millimeter group of the 9th Defense basically got busted up and the men sent to other units and other places. The same happened to most of the other portions of the other roughly 19 defense battalions that had this heavy artillery component. They all became anti-aircraft units. And so the ones that remained in service of the Pacific were strictly anti-aircraft. But there were, there were lessons they had taught the Marines and the American military. This included use of radar, uh, extensive use of anti-aircraft, uh, also in coordination with Allied Air Forces. They did a lot of work with the Royal New Zealand and the Royal Australian Air Forces. And so there were value efforts you know, engaged in learning how to be ground type, ground manned anti-aircraft working with other people's air forces to defend your airspace against the enemy. Uh, deployment of heavy artillery like this that had heretofore been used by Marines only as coastal guns were now being used offensively. And so a lot of lessons were learned with that. Also tank warfare and jungle environments. As I said, uh, to go from eight tanks to roughly you know, 14 or 15 was a pretty significant development, particularly when you're fighting in jungles, and they found there's a way you can do that. So when my father got back to Franklin, Tennessee, you know, in January 1945, he knew a lot of his friends had been killed. He knew that his best friend, David Gentry, had died. He didn't know about all of them, though, and his mom and dad told him about a lot of his other high school buddies and school buddies who had died, and it really ripped him up. And so the legacy of Franklin, Tennessee is, again, a county of roughly 15,000 people in 1945. You can see this list behind me. That article then was reduced to a plaque which is now still found at the Williamson County Archives, and that's the plaque you see on the right of this photo. Uh, a significant number of people. There was no way that you could live in a town the size of Franklin, Tennessee, and not know somebody who had died in the war or somebody who had lost a family member who had died. And so that's quite a legacy when we think about it. And we think then about, again, going back in time, 82 years today, what we didn't know was coming our way. But Jack McCall and his friends did not know was coming their way. That is a legacy to think about. Well, my father survived the war, obviously. I wouldn't be here. Uh, and he ended up getting into the dry goods business. He ultimately became an executive with Genesco, uh, raised myself and my sister. You see the two of us with my mom and with my godmother in that photo taken at my wedding in 1991. My father died in 1997. The reason this book exists is in large part because of what he was going through with emphysema in May of 1997. He told me as he was at the Williamson County Hospital, son, folks from the county archives wanted to come interview me and do me, you know, do an oral interview with me and put me on tape. But with my emphysema, I just hadn't felt good. And I'm not sure I'm up to that. And so he kept talking for a bit. And then he said, do you see what I'm saying? And I'm putting my glasses on because I'm used as a prop. When he said something, he wanted me to do it, he would look at me like this over his glasses. So he kind of talks like this and he said, and I'm just not sure I'm up to it. Look, okay, dad, you, you, you want to have me do something? Son, what have you got in mind? Mm -hmm. Like, well, I can, you know, I know enough about the stories you've told us. You've got a battalion history. You've got a lot of friends alive. Biggie Slater is the head of a reunion association of the Ninth Defense. You've got 300 members. And he says, son, I'd like to have you do that. 
He was dead in three days. And so later that fall, after I took some time off, I started doing that memoir. In the meantime, it fell upon me to be the member of the family who had to call all of his business associates and all his Marine buddies to tell them that he had died. And the business associates had known and kept up with my dad. And so they knew he was in bad health. And they all, you know, took it as one would expect, losing an old business colleague or an old work friend. Oh, man, your dad was such a great guy, son. I know you loved him. We all loved him. He was just a wonderful guy. But every one of the Marines I called just started sobbing. And they would say things like, we were like brothers. No, we were closer than brothers because I went through things with him that I never went through with my brother. And then I began to understand why they called up and why they were so jovial and why they was like, hey, boy, get pogey bait on the phone. And he would just be happy as a clam talking to him. And I also realized that the one day a year that he would get calls from five or 10 or 15 of these guys was July 4th. And I realized it had nothing so much to do with the 4th of July as it did that that was the day they survived that air raid. That was July 4th, 1943, the day they survived that air raid and shot down an entire squadron of Japanese bombers. And that was probably one of the happiest days of his life. And they were saying to each other, you made it, and I made it, and here we are. And so you and I have basically made it in this little saga. The last thing I'll leave you with is this. This is a picture of a monument that still stands at Paris Island near the parade ground where all the new recruits, once they are no longer boots and are now privates in the Marine Corps, march and get their recognition. And at this field where there are several monuments, you will find the monument that was erected in 1989 to the 9th Marine Defense Battalion and Anti-Aircraft Battalion, and this is it. And my father never got to see it, but many years he, would, he had a picture of this that hung up next to his rocking chair in our den, really from like months after this thing was first hung up and, or first put up in 1989. And for years he would say, son, if you ever get to Paris Island, I want you to visit this monument for me. And I finally got to do this this March. I went to Beaufort, South Carolina, realized how close it was, and I said, I've got to find that monument. And I looked around and I found it, and when I did, I put my hand on it. And I thought not just about him, but I thought about all these other guys who I'd gotten to know and tell their story. And I think that's probably about as good a way to remember their legacy as anything. So I thank you all for your time. I'd welcome any questions. Yes, sir. That, that's a great question, to a degree. Uh, they were given, the, uh, the term I think is called an LVT, landing vehicle tract. They called them alligators. They had at one point four alligators assigned to them, and then later they had some others they loaned from some other marine units. Uh, they also had a pretty large motor pool, and so I've seen pictures of some of their trucks and Jeeps. You know, for certain things, they absolutely could use their own organic equipment and move around. Uh, the one thing I'll say, though, going beyond transportation, supply, oh, they had to scrounge like crazy. There are so many stories in the book, I won't spoil them all for you, but there is like virtually a whole subchapter devoted to scrounging and, and, and the efforts they would go to to find everything from like additional food and cigarettes to finding additional Jeeps. David Slater said that they had the best group of Jeep thieves in the entire U.S. military, and that was nothing to them to capture a U.S. Army olive drab Jeep and have it painted in navy gray with Marine Corps insignia within no time flat. <laughs> so that might be another way of answering your question. Yeah, they, they did have some, but they had to rely on five-finger discounts and other uh, subversive ways of getting their supply and transportation right. taken Necessity care of. Can be the mother of this is true. <laughs> There were a lot of mothers in that unit, for sure. <laughs> Other questions? Well, you all have been a great audience. I'll stick around for a little bit afterwards, so if you want to ask me anything one-on-one, -on -one, I'd love to talk with you all. Thank you all so much.